Hello and a warm welcome to all of you. We have Aukar Bui with us to talk about interpret your monads, concrete monads versus monads uh, classes. I'm uh, believing this is going to be a wonderful session. So with no further ado, over to you, Aukar. Let me first go ahead and try to share my screen. Welcome to the talk. And I have to say uh, thanks for the thanks to the organizers for for hosting this uh, this event and uh, uh, it seems, seems to be going great. I'm very, very happy to, to see all the activity going around. So um, that's, that's really, really inspiring. Um, I want to talk about an aspect of uh, the Haskell language and how we deal with effects in Haskell. Uh, before I do that, I want to say a few words about, uh, about Hasa, which is the company I'm working for. Uh, at Hasa, we're building a data access solution uh, and from a technical or abstract point of view, you could perhaps see this as a GraphQL to SQL compiler. And the uh, backend is written in Haskell, and so that's 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 why I, that's why I'm talking about about Haskell today. We are hiring. Uh, please check out the link if you're if you're interested. You can also talk to us uh, at at the at the online conference booth, um, uh, which is happening. I think even simultaneously with this event. Um, yes, and this talk touches on some things that have been that, that we've done on uh, at Hasira, but they should apply to a more general uh, to more general Haskell programming. So first, for some motivation, uh, here is a piece of code of our test suite. Um, it's it's an exhaustive test. It, it, it tests over, over all uh, Unicode characters. Can you, by the way, see my mouse? Does my mouse, is, is my mouse visible? Yes, it's visible. Perfect. So you see over here that it's, uh, we do a loop over all possible characters and test some, some property for, for each individual character. And this is happening um, uh, using the Hedgehog property testing library. And that means that this is a bit, an, a bit of an app use of the Hedgehog library because it's built for property testing and not, not for unit testing, which is what this is. And indeed, in this code, we see a memory leak popping up. The memory usage grows to two gigabytes, even though this is only a very simple test. Uh, and that's due to the nature of the Hedgehog shrinking mechanism. In this particular instance, we're not interested in Hedgehog's advanced features of this shrinking mechanism or, uh, or anything. It's just a simple exhaustive test that we quickly wanted to include in our, in our test suite. Um, and so my question is, can we quickly improve the import, uh, performance here uh, without swapping out the testing framework, without having to re rewrite a bunch of code, et cetera? And the answer is, yes, somewhat. So here's the change that I make. I add one additional uh, method in, 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 the, in the calls. Um, and it's, it's an existing method from the Hedgehog library that we insert and it doesn't change the behavior. It uh, doesn't change uh, 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 the correctness of this test. Uh, it's exactly the same test, but now it only uses less than half of the memory that it used before. So this is a quick and dirty way to improve performance in this, in this particular case. And let's be honest, we can't always afford to write great code. So in this talk, I want to talk about what just happened, why this small method changed memory, uh, uh, memory behavior so radically, uh, what general principle underlies that and how we can understand it in, in, the, most general, uh, in the most general setting. Um, so this talk consists of four sections and uh, as announced, uh, there's time for questions after each. So do please, uh, uh, in the meantime, use the Q&A feature to, uh, to collect questions. So the story is that several times uh, over the last years, I encountered a situation in which it made sense, and that's, that's gonna be the, the trick underlying this, uh, in which made sense to mix uh, uh, concrete monads and uh, abstract MTL style uh, code. And there's a, there's, there's a seemingly general principle behind this, which I have a feeling is also um, under the radar, understood by a lot of Haskell programmers, um, but it's not often discussed explicitly. And so I, I, I want to talk about it explicitly today. 
Um, so we're going to discuss about what is, so I, 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 I'm terming this effect interpretation. And we're going to discuss what this effect interpretation is, um, why it does what it does, like why, why it can have such a, a, such a big impact on, on uh, runtime behavior. Uh, some other applications, some tricks that you can can do with this with this general principle, and finally we'll start working towards a mathematical understanding of of what uh, what effect interpretation is, and in particular uh, when when we could consider it to be lawful. Uh, and eventually, I'll I'll talk about talk a bit uh, talk about increasing talk in increasing detail about categories of monads, monad transformers, and the history behind them. Uh, eventually, working towards the M morph library, and I guess at some point, at some point, we'll run out of time while nerding out on category theory. So, first of all, what is uh, effect interpretation? So, when you write Haskell code uh, with a uh, with with effects. Um, we usually use uh, monads uh, to to uh, be able to express these these effects, and there are roughly speaking two main ways in which you can uh, specify the side effects of a particular piece of code. One is an abstract way, uh, which is usually uh, associated with the MTL library. Um, where you specify abstractly that uh, you that you require a monad with certain uh, side effects, and uh, because of this because of the abstract nature of this approach, you get more guarantees about the code because it has less expressive power. Whereas another approach is to use uh, to use concrete uh, monads along the way, and this gives you more control because you always know exactly which monad you're in, um, and it gives you fewer guarantees because of this added expressivity. So um, one thing to realize is that even if you're always using such abstract uh, specifications of your, of your side effects, at the end of the day, you always still need to instantiate them. Like if you want to, like when you, when you finally get to compiling and running the code, you still need to instantiate the effects to a concrete monad. And so what uh, like the usual approach for doing this is that you have a, a global, uh, one global monad that somehow encapsulates um, all of the side effects of your, of your program. And this, this can be called app. So here's here I introduced the app monad uh, and it specifies that we have two side effects, namely state and, uh, uh, and errors. Um, and when you choose such a monad, then that means that all of these, um, uh, all of this code written in abstract effects gets instantiated to the same uh, to the same global application monad. So this means that they're immediately compatible and uh, that that that, the, that they can be run. However, there, it's not it's not it's perhaps not an ideal um, instant, a choice of instantiation, and I'll I'll make clear later why like what exactly the problem is with this instantiation. Uh, but it could be it could be more accurate in some cases to only instantiate what you need. So, for instance, for for F one, F one only has an error side effect, and so you could say, well, why don't we just uh, instantiate it to the exception monad only? And F two only specifies that it requires a state side effect, so why don't we instantiate it to the state uh, monad? And F three, well, it seems to require everything that our application monad offers, so let's just instantiate it to the app monad. The reason that we don't that we don't do this normally is that now these three methods work in different monads and hence they're not, in the first instance, they're, they're not easily compatible with each other. Um, they cannot call each other easily. So uh, there's, there's a, uh, uh, that's the reason that we don't, that we don't normally do this. So that's that's one translation between these two boxes, namely that we can that we always have to take abstract code to uh, to concrete side effects uh, through instantiation. And what isn't being discussed explicitly yet, and what I want to talk about, is that there is also an arrow in the opposite direction, which I'm going to call interpretation, where you take code written in a concrete uh, monad, such as the either uh, the exception. Uh, uh, monad and generalize it to an abstract monad. 
so how does that work? How, 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 how can we do this interpretation? Um, and another question you might have here is like, what, what happens if you, if you go down and up again or up and down again? Like what's, what's, what happens if you go, if you do round trips along these arrows? So I'll show you how to, how to do this interpretation. Here I take a concrete reader effect. Like I, could, I, take, uh, 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 I take an output value in the reader monad and I interpret it in an, into an abstract monad reader M. How can you do this? Well, this reader effect is it's just a function, right? So uh, we need to evaluate it on, on some input, input value R. Where do we get the R from? Well, from our abstract monad. So we just ask for it and evaluate the, the incoming uh, function on, on that value. And now we've generalized the concrete, uh, concrete side effect to an abstract side effect. Similarly, uh, we can do something for writers. So if you have a code written in a concrete writer monad, then it can be generalized or interpreted to an abstract writer simply by uh, telling the value that we have that, that we've been passed so we, we actually write that value uh, and then we return the value a as uh, as we're supposed to one thing you might wonder is well why i mean uh, why do we need to do this uh, how does the compiler uh, in which sense are we forced to do this writing operation at all um can't we just only return the value this has the same type right like what's 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 the problem with with only returning the value here well it's unlawful it doesn't satisfy uh, certain uh, correctness laws that we have to specify that I'll, that I'll make that I'll make precise later on um and and I'll do that after discussing the mathematical foundations of this idea in fact this uh uh, interpretation of writers into abstract writer monads um, is already part of the monad writer type class. Uh, it, like it's already it's already there as the writer method, and this confirms my suspicion that that effect interpretation uh, is is a widespread technique which is just not discussed directly. So, what other interpretations of uh, concrete monads uh, exist? So here's here's a couple that I that I found. Um, so what we already so uh, the the either um, the either effect can be interpreted into an abstract monad error. Readers and writers can be interpreted as as we discussed on the previous slide. State can be interpreted. You just you know you fetch the state from the abstract monad. Ooh, there are some arguments missing here. Um, you fetch the state from the abstract monad, evaluate this function, and then put the new state. So there's there's nothing there's nothing surprising going on. We can lift IO operations, which is a kind of interpretation. And uh, identity side effect can be interpreted in an, in an arbitrary monad. There are also some interpretations, uh, some, interp some notions of effect interpretation that are never possible, such as the continu continuation monad. Um, and there are some cases where it's not clear. So here are some things to think about. What is the minimum? What is the required information to uh, to interpret something into an abstract monad, which is both a reader and a writer? Uh, or can we also interpret concrete code, uh, concrete uh, code with concrete side effects into something weaker than monads, such as arrows? Um, how can we interpret uh, monad transformers? So the summary of the section so far, and this will also be the time for you to ask questions, is that there is, uh, so it, code is often written uh, in terms of abstract side effects using MTL. Uh, and if you do that, then the uh, code still needs to get instantiated to concrete monads. The choice of the concrete monads you choose to instantiate to might matter a lot. And I'll discuss next why this, why it matters a lot. Which leads you to the, which, which might raise the question, you know, which monads are good or problematic to instantiate. And then conversely, there's a notion of interpretation from concrete effects to abstract effects. And some of those methods are, uh, some of those interpretation methods are easy to write, but some don't exist and some are unlawful and some it's not clear. 
So this raises the question of uh, when we when it's allowed to use interpretation uh, and also when it is actually useful to do this. And finally, there's there's the question which I raised before of what happens when we when we combine instantiation and interpretation. Are there any questions at this point? No, we're good. Oh yeah, um, actually, someone has raised a uh, uh, raise their hand. But probably right now we cannot uh, take such questions. We would be only be able to take typed questions. So let's see if we have time for audience to ask questions and unmute them. Yes. Sounds fine. I will continue. If, if questions about the first section come up, then please do interrupt me. Yeah, sure. So what is this, uh, this effect interpretation? How does it work? But what's happening here? So what I want to explain is why the particular instantiation to uh, the global app monad might in some cases be uh, uh, undesirable. Uh, and so why the arrow here to the left is problematic. So let's look at uh, how the monad instance for, okay, so I should say here that this global app monad is defined in terms of uh, monad transformers. So let's understand better what the monad instance for, uh, for monad transformers looks like. So here's, here's the one for, for the state T, right? So, uh, a monad is, well, I didn't show, I, I cut out a few things right here. So uh, I, I'm not showing a return operation. What's important here is, is, the, is the bind operation. That's, 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 that's the problematic part. So the bind operation, which is being defined here for the state monad, it's, uh, it's defined, uh, well, what, what do we do? We somehow run the state T and then run the state T. There's a lot of, this is somehow some kind of effect juggling that's going on. Um, and Maybe in, in this syntax, it's not, it's not really clear what's happening. So I'll, I'll, I'll rewrite this by uh, uh, um, uh, changing the, the do syntax to uh, spelling out the binds explicitly. And then we get this. Right? So this says that the bind for the state uh, monad transformer is actually defined in terms of the bind for the underlying monad M. Um, and 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 that's 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 where um, that that's where our inefficiency inefficiency comes in. So, put differently, if you call the if you're in uh, the app if you're uh, if you're writing in terms of if your code is instantiated for the app monad and it uses the bind operation, um, it's gonna call the underlying uh, bind operation from the underlying monad uh, un until it reaches the bottom here. And that also means that if your uh, code uses, a, so if you have a very thick effect stack in your, in your app monad, but you have a particular method that only uses one effect, it's still gonna call the bind operations until it reaches the bottom. So here's, here's kind of the, the, the visualization of that. So let's suppose that you have, uh, that you have an effect stack with, with, with four, uh, so you have the, uh, as the underlying monad, you have IO and then three, uh, three transformers. You have the state effect, accumulation monad, and, a, and an exception monad. So for each of those, uh, each of the invocations of bind on the entire app monad, the, uh, the, the, um, bind the bind operation defined for the exception monad is, called a, is gonna call the bind operation for the accumulation monad. And that's gonna call the, uh, uh, bind operation of the state monad, and that's going to call the bind operation of the IO monad. So in realistic effect stacks, um, the bind operation follows the chain of effects on each invocation of uh, the bind operation. And what I've tried to visualize here is that it might even invoke the next layer's bind operation several times, such as in the case of the accumulation monad, which uh, yeah, which is the which is the underlying mon underlying bind operation twice, like the the bind operation of the underlying monad it uses it twice. Whereas um, if you're if you're if you're if the, if one particular method in your program only uses state, uh, well the only bind operation that you would want it to use is 
is this one for states and not, not any of the other ones. And so by first instantiating that monad to a particular uh, precise, uh, sorry, by first instantiating uh, such abstract methods to, uh, to a particular uh, simple monad, such as uh, state, not state T, but state, mm -hmm. um, we have simplified the, the chosen implementation for the bind operation. Uh, and we only get a single, single link chain of bind operations. So this cuts out all of the links of the chain that we're not interested in. And, when, and then by, uh, by then interpreting uh, the precisely instantiated code abstractly again, we regain the compatibility and the abstraction of, of uh, abstract effects. But now after this interpretation, the effects of the precisely instantiated code uh, would have been uh, isolated from the rest. And so we don't suffer from inefficiencies elsewhere down the, uh, elsewhere in the chain. So to clarify this effect of, maybe I go back to it, um, this, this effect that we saw um, for uh, over here, it's uh, the, the reduction memory usage is not, it's not a matter of specialization. It's, it's a matter of a different choice of bind operation, a simpler bind operation, which severely reduced memory usage here. Um, So in the opening example, we avoided some, we avoided some, uh, uh, some memory leakage without, without any real effort to speak of. So you might wonder, well, what's, what's, what's kind of the general recipe here? What's the cookbook uh, scenario in which we should, should do this kind of a trick? The ideal scenario is that you have calling code or uh, maybe application code, which, which, has a lot of, which has a lot of effects. Uh, and these effects are instantiated by an effect stack, so by monad transformers. And there are some callee code, some code that's being called that only uses one effect, but it uh, it uses the bind operation a lot. Um, so um, this, this you could use this kind of a technique to avoid or reduce some memory leakage without any effort. You uh, could also use this to um, to uh, optimize code that is quite simply being very heavily hammered uh, and, 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 and where every percentage of, of performance counts. So in summary, the bind operation for monad transformers suffers from a kind of weakest link effect, where even if you're, even if some, even if you're running a particular piece of code that doesn't use uh, the majority of the chain, it still suffers from inefficiencies elsewhere in the chain um, that, it's, that it's not interested in. And by using something like effect interpretation, you can cut out uh, the rest of the chain. Questions so far? Yeah, there is one uh, by Philip. It says, I'm not sure I understood how the functions in the first section are interpreters of concrete monads into monad type classes. Many of the functions did not have the concrete monad to the left of an arrow. This was on first section. So I'm not entirely sure uh, I got the question. So uh, uh, yeah. as I speak, it would be great if it can be clarified. So here is one method, this lift test, which takes code in a concrete test monad and it interprets, it interprets it into an abstract monad M. And of course there's a condition on M, which is that it is an instance of monad test. And similarly, uh, where did I have it? Here are five more uh, interpretation functions and they go from concrete monads over here, either a reader, a writer, a state, IO and identity to abstract monads on the right-hand side of the arrow. So they interpret from concrete to abstract. Does, does that help? Is, is there any clarification on, on the question? And, and once again, I'm, I'm missing some type parameters here. I'm, I'm sorry for that. It should be monad state S, M, and monad IO, M. There's a 
comment uh, from Philip again, uh, where it says, it says reader, it doesn't say reader array, it says R gives A. Yeah, ah, right. So I, sorry about that. Yeah. So I, this, this is, this is the underlying type of the reader monad. Uh, there, this is, that's exactly the same as reader RA. So uh, a reader RA is literally a function from R to A. And similarly, uh, writer WA is exactly a tuple A comma W. Or, well, that's one of the possible implementations, um, but, but it's, it's the canonical implementation of the writer monad. And the underlying type of the state monad is a, a function uh, just like this. So I've, I've simply spelled out the types, uh, I've, I've spelled out the monads explicitly. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Great. Oh, and by the way, similarly here for the continuation monad, I have spelled out the continuation monad for R explicitly. Um, yes. Good. So then we go to uh, look at some other applications of this interpretation technique. And I'm going to show two. So here is um, here's a get out of jail free card um, that you might uh, might be lucky enough uh, to be able to use at some point. Let's say you have uh, two uh, pieces of code. We have some f and some g, and f wants to call function g. And what we know for f is it it's um, uh, f. Um, F is working in an abstract uh, monad a monad IO. And it wants to call another method G. And uh, G also works in a monad IO, but it requires an additional constraint to be satisfied, namely that M is a monad fix. Well, at first instance, well, F cannot call G because uh, the compiler would complain no instance for monad fix. Interpretation can, can get you out of jail in this case, can, can help you save the day. Because what you can do is you can instantiate G, the method G, to the IO monad specifically. And the monad, the IO monad specifically, we do know that it satisfies uh, monad fix. We have, a, we, have a, we have an instance for monad fix IO. Um, and then this concrete, uh, this instantiated G can be interpreted into the abstract monad IO. So, um, this is to say that it just so happens that for the concrete monad IO, uh, we have more instances available than we get from the overarching type class monad IO. And so this, this uh, in some sense allows you to conjure up type class instances uh, um, when you're somewhere, you know, uh, uh, it, it, maybe, maybe it was not possible to rewrite F because you don't want to add constraints here, but in fact, you don't need to rewrite F. You don't need to add, add any constraints because by interpreting G uh, after instantiating it to IO, um, uh, you don't need any additional constraints. So that's one application of this interpretation technique. And another one is about writing Haskell arrows. Now, I know that, um, uh, uh, arrows are not used very widely in Haskell, uh, and 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 there's there's a debate on whether or not it's a, it's a good idea to use them in the first place. But it's a fact that they have important applications in um, in in Haskell, and um, so I don't want to say uh, any anything more than that. It's a fact that, that there is arrows based code, um, and and so that. that uh, this is this is just a tool in tool in the toolbox, right? So just like uh, monads are usually written in terms of the like with the syntactic sugar of uh, monadic do syntax, Haskell arrows um, are usually written with the syntactic sugar of the arrows language ex extension. And here on the screen you can see some of it. And as you have already probably observed, it's quite a difficult and um, uh, uh, verbose syntax. Now, the trick here is that using interpretation, we can avoid uh, using this arrow syntax while still writing uh, arrows. Um, so even if you've never seen uh, a single uh, arrow syntax, 
you already know enough about monads in order to write some uh, Haskell arrows. So we can invite, in fact, write some Haskell arrows with monadic do syntax. And by the way, I don't understand, I don't expect you to, to understand what this code is actually doing here. This is just to highlight the syntax, right? The, the, this is just to highlight the, 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 the verbosity of, of the Haskell arrow syntax. So um, this code can be written in monadic do syntax like this. And having having written it in monadic do syntax, well, of course we're gonna get we're gonna get a monad uh, we're gonna get a monadic uh, f we're gonna get code out with a monadic monadic effect. But this monadic effect can sometimes be interpreted in um, uh, into has, uh, into abstract Haskell arrows. And to clarify, this is this can be done um, to build uh, Haskell arrows. Uh, Haskell arrows that are not instances of, of the Cliasd class. So, so non-Cliasd arrows, so non-monadic arrows can be written with this technique. All right, so that's that's two uh, funny applications of this interpretation technique. So next I want to work, to work towards uh, understanding when, uh, like what effect interpretation is from a mathematical point of view, and in particular to understand uh, when we could consider it lawful. Uh, are there any uh, questions so far? No, there aren't any new questions. Right, so let's jump into some mathematics. And I want to start with a yeah. citation from Andre Bauer or a paraphrasing by Andre Bauer from Phil Wadler. Monads as a programming concept would not have been discovered without their category theoretic counterparts. But once they were, programmers could live in, in blissful ignorance of their origin. So today I want to say, let's look at the origins of monads for once. I think there are some lessons to be learned um, uh, even from, from the original work on, on monads in, in uh, computation. I have to preface this entire discussion with the disclaimer that I'm going to set aside the question of whether there is a, 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 in, a, in, in, in a true sense, a category called Hask uh, and whether, you're, whether or not you can truly do category theory in, in Haskell. Let, let's glance over that discussion. So the key concept to underlying effect interpretation is that of monad morphisms. Um, monad morphisms are the morphisms of a category of monads uh, in Haskell. So I won't, uh, won't dive uh, into, uh, I won't, I won't uh, spell out what monad morphisms are in detail, uh, although I get, I'll, I'll say some things about it later on. Uh, in fact, it's, it's not really important. Um, the key thing to know is that monad morphisms are certain polymorphic maps like this, that has have to satisfy some uh, conditions. So one is naturality, uh, that they're natural transformation. Um, and, and then there's, there are two more conditions that essentially say that they're compatible with the monadic structure on M and on N. Um, so the interpretation functions that we've seen before are all uh, monad morphisms. So, so here I've, I've, I've copied a bunch of them. So. So lift IO is, uh, an, is an example of a monad morphism. Lift either and lift are also uh, monad morphisms. And, and then finally generalize. And I want to focus on generalize because it satisfies a particular uh, property. Generalize is the only monad morphism from the identity monad. Um, so there is no other monad morphism that you can define out of out of uh, the identity monad. Or put differently, every other uh, monad morphism out of the identity monad is provably equal to generalize. And it works for for every uh, like it, it's it's a monad morphism to any other monad. Uh, it's it's not restricted in in its in its codomain. So to spell that out in, in category theory terms, in the category of monads, whose objects are instances of monads, so the objects are Haskell monads, and whose morphisms are monad morphisms, identity is an initial object. So this is spelling out the fact that 
uh, from identity, there is exactly one monad morphism to any other monad. And in particular, this, this one uh, monad morphism is, is, um, uh, uh, is, is found as generalized. Generalized does the trick, and it's the only thing that does the trick. OK, so that's kind of a nice characterization of generalize as an interpretation function. But what about our other interpretation functions? Like, can we somehow similarly characterize them in, in terms of category theory? So uh, for instance, let's look at error, error interpretation. So what can we say about monad morphisms and monad error? Let's suppose that we have two monad error E monads. We have M and we have N, and they're both implementations of monad error E. When is a monad morphism between them uh, compatible with this monad error structure? When does it somehow preserve the errors? Well, a monad error instance is defined by two, um, by two uh, type class members. So there's, there's throw error and there's catch error. So somehow a mo any monad morphism between monad errors better be compatible with the respective uh, implementations of throw error and catch error. So here's one way to make that precise, to say that throw error composed with T. So this is the throw error happening in M. Uh, is exactly the same as the throw error that comes from N. And similarly for the catch, uh, oh, sorry, this should be, this should say catch error, not catch, I'm sorry about it. Uh, similarly for the catch error um, method, uh, whether we do T before doing, uh, so whether we do T on the entire thing or whether we do T on the arguments, that should be the same thing. And so if these conditions are satisfied, then we, we might call such, such a monad morphism T, we could call that a monad error monad morphism. So the T is a monad error monad morphism if these two additional constraints are satisfied. So with like having said all of this, I can say the magic property of error interpretation. The characterization of lift either is that it is the only monad error monad morphism from either E. It exists uniquely as a map to any other monad error E. In other words, lift either is the only monad morphism out of the either type that is compatible with monad errors. Again, phrasing this in some more uh, category theoretic language. In the monad error E category, whose objects are monad error E monads, and whose morphisms are monad morphisms compatible with those errors, either E is an initial object. So this, I think, characterizes our notion of effect interpretation, that, um, that there are certain initial objects in categories of monads. So maybe I uh, make a pause here for questions, even though it's not the end of a section, because uh, next I will uh, just uh, dive into more and more uh, details of uh, mathematical category theory until I run out of time. So this would absolutely yeah. be a good question to ask questions. Yeah. Um, okay, we have one question uh, uh, and yeah, this is a small reminder that we are just uh, five minutes to the end of the session. Mm -hmm. The question is, is uniqueness important here? So, um, uniqueness is not, uh, I mean, I mean, in, in Haskell land, it is not something that you, uh, observe. It's not something that, um, um, that is somehow, uh, visible on the Haskell side. For me, it is a motivation that, so the, the uniqueness expresses that in some sense, so for either here, that either is the most basic and the most fundamental representation of errors. You could also consider other implementations for which this uniqueness property is not satisfied, and then there would also be a valid notion of interpretation. Uh, but then you don't have um, so once you, once you let go of this uniqueness, then there's there are choices to be made on which which monad morphism you choose, and that means that um, in general there could be a behavioral difference um, at runtime on 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 which in which uh, which interpretation you choose. 
So this is, um, so, okay. Is it important? Well, it means that there is, so w when you have this uniqueness, then it's a thing that you don't have to think about. It's, it's, a, it's a guarantee that you have. Uh, it's, um, yeah. So uh, do, do, would, I, would I restrict interpretation to only those cases where we have the uniqueness? No, I think interpretation makes perfect sense also when you don't have the uniqueness. But when you do have the uniqueness, I, I think there's a, more, uh, there's a more clear mathematical modeling of, of, of what we're doing. I hope that helps. So if there are no further questions, then I will continue just diving deeper and deeper into, into mathematics. So now I want to, I want to show a little bit of, of the history behind Monad. So, so here's the definition of a Monad in the original paper that introduced Monads to functional programming. It's from 1989, this paper. And here's definition 1.1, defining a monad as, as a triple T eta mu. And, um, and this eta is, is uh, it's, it's what in, in Haskell is called the return operation and mu is the, in Haskell, it's called the join operation. And the point here is, is not to understand the mathematical symbols and the details of, 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 the, of the notation here. It's just to show that uh, this, this, uh, the monads essentially in essence are a very old concept. Um, and yeah, the, the, their Haskell, uh, in Haskell version now, now looks something like this, of course. And I want to talk about this because, um, um, well, I, what I want to work towards is that, uh, also monad transform, so I, I think this is not broadly known uh, that monad transformers are also not such a new idea. In fact, also already in 1989, monad transformers were, were, uh, were, were being considered and I'll, 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 sh I'll show that in a few slides. So first of all, to, so one of the main things that, that, uh, that, that, that uh, Eugenio Mogi was, was, was doing in this paper is explaining concepts in functional pro programming in terms of uh, uh, category theory and pure mathematics. And so um, if you want to do, so sorry, was there a question or? Uh, yeah, actually just a reminder that we are uh, at the end of our time. So can you wrap up the session in a minute? Sure, let me, let me very quickly show you some, uh, some, uh, some one or two final slides and then, then, I, then I wrap up. So uh, I quickly show you that, um, that here is here's uh, Mogi's uh, representation of monad transformers, also already from 1989, and um, and what what Mogi then continues to look at is is whether these monad transformers themselves have some kind of object uh, have some kind of category theoretic uh, meaning, and that is when he when he's led to the question of when a monad transformer is a functor and or uh, a monad itself. And that leads us to the to the uh, uh, M morph library in, in Haskell. So the takeaways takeaways of the talk is that um, we can optimize MTL based code pretty much for free without without much elbow grease. And sometimes it's a lot, and often it's it's just a few percent. And it's very often in the premature optimization domain. So uh, I definitely wouldn't recommend anybody to apply this kind of technique. Uh, too broadly. I don't wish one. Uh, I don't wish to advocate for or criticize MTL or extensible effects, uh, algebraic effects handlers, etc. No, it's, it's just a tool in the box. And let's talk about. Uh, let's give. Let's give the tools in our box a name. And this tool is a compatibility between MTL-based code and code based on uh, concrete effects. That uh, also, as as a as an as an alternative application, allows us to fulfill type class constraints that are not, not in scope. It allows us to write arrows with monadic do syntax, at least sometimes. And I think in general, it shows that we shouldn't think of uh, the question of MTL, ver uh, we shouldn't think of MTL and transformers as the MTL lib library and the transformers library as, a, as an uh, if or else, like it shouldn't be a versus, but it should be end. We should combine 
thinking in terms of concrete monads and thinking in terms of monad classes. I think it's important to understand the category of monads better. Um, even if surprisingly, for the most part, the MMORF library is, is not central to this, uh, to this question. And with that, I guess I wrap up. Thank you very much for your attention and the good questions. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for your uh, uh, time and the wonderful session.